to Onside, the official podcast of Sport Integrity Australia. Our mission is to protect the integrity of sport and the health and welfare of those who participate in Australian sport. Hello and welcome to Onside. I'm Tim Gavel. This week's program explores the evolution of Paralympic sport in Australia. We also discuss the need to include Paralympic voices in the decision-making process, along with the role Paralympic sport can play as a vehicle for greater social inclusion and to understand disability. Today's guests include Paralympians Ella Sabelczek and Richard Nicholson. Ella is a member of the World Anti-Doping Agency Athlete Council and Sport Integrity Australia's Athlete Advisory Group, while Richard Nicholson is a two-time Paralympic silver medalist and part of Sport Integrity Australia's sports partnership team. But first, whether you're an NRL, AFL, netball, cricket or A-League fan, all eyes will be on the Matildas ahead of the FIFA Women's World Cup later this month as 32 teams from around the world compete for football's holy grail. While off the field, racism and abuse in sport have dominated the headlines as players, coaches and codes call out abuse, particularly online. In January, Sport Integrity Australia launched a Safe Sport Hotline which includes an anonymous reporting capability that covers wider racial and cultural issues in sport for people who feel as though they've been discriminated against in their sport. You can call the hotline on 1800 161 361. Our first guest, Ella Sabelczek, has more than 15 years' experience at an international level. Ella captained Australia's under-25 women's wheelchair basketball team, the Devils, to a World Championship silver medal and is also a Commonwealth Games silver medalist. She's currently the Education Manager at Paralympics Australia and a member of the Australian Steelers team competing at the Asia Oceania Wheelchair Rugby Championships in Tokyo. Ella, welcome to Onside. You're a champion athlete, but you've also become a leading advocate for athletes' rights. Uh, What led you down this path? Um, I've always, you know, fought for the underdog and love... um helping athletes have their own voice. And so when I started my journey in this, it only started as a captain of a team and, you know, rallying the troops together, hearing what they have to say and relaying that message back to coaches. And then from there, it progressed. We, um, I was nominated for our International Wheelchair Basketball Federation Athlete Commission. And so there was four of us from each zone who were nominated and we were put together as a little bit of a steering committee to help uh, develop an athlete committee or commission in wheelchair basketball. So we did all the hard work. We wrote all like the terms of reference, the statutes, and really paved the way. And the, we got a little bit of a pushback from the organisation. But once they saw that, how much the athletes added value and their voice, they started respecting us and coming to us and asking for more. So that was kind of the start of where we are at. And then... Um, I was nominated by the IWBF to sit on the WADA Athlete Committee. And, yeah, it's just been a journey. When you were playing, of course, you played with the the gliders at the 2020 um, Paralympics. I just wondered, did you you have some issues there as you were an athlete, realising that that athletes weren't having a say and, and didn't have too many rights? You know, it was... It's not until you're reflecting upon it. When you're in the thick of it, you don't really realise that athletes' voices aren't heard until, you know, you're sitting back home after the fact and you really wish you could have made an impact or you're seeing things differently. So I think that reflection piece as an athlete moving forward has really, like, shaped how how I carry myself and how I approach situations now. So I... You know, the power of the pause, you think about it, and um, we're trying to establish an athlete committee in Australia or in Australia and also in our zone, so the Asia Oceana zone, um, and just trying to make the most impact we can where we can. So, in terms of specifics, what sort of things are we looking at here in terms of things that you reflect on now that you think, well, it could have been done better? Yeah, so the classification system in wheelchair basketball, we had a little bit of an issue with um, the classification, uh, the IPC 
reviewed the classification system and then they filtered down the results to the IWBF and then we had we had to do a whole review of our classification system and during COVID a number of our players got classed out so they were deemed ineligible to participate in the Paralympic Games. So it wasn't only basketball, it was multiple sports, tennis, swimming, athletics um, and just the way that the system was handled and athletes weren't told until it was the last moment. So we didn't have time to prepare. We had, it was a bit, it was such a shock to the system and it was super, super scary. So people's careers were being ended because of this decision. I'm not saying that it was. There's no consultation really. No, there was absolutely no consultation. So the athletes were taken off guard Um you know, careers were ended. And so when formulating our athlete commission, we really pushed to have athlete voices on every different department and committee within our organisation just so that we can be across it and then relay the messages back to the athletes to prevent something like this happening again. Now, the IPC classification review was inevitable and it is it is what it is and I'm, we're not disputing that but just the way that the situation was handled to make it a little bit more seamless for the athletes to hear those decisions so we're really pushing just to get athletes sitting in and discussing the meetings um yeah. to have that voice do you feel as though your advocacy has reached uh it's zenith to a certain degree with election to the the wider 20 person committee I as, hope so. as an athlete representative do you feel as though okay we've got a real chance now yeah, yeah, I really hope so. So I am, um, yeah, I'm super stoked. I wasn't expecting to be nominated on the WADA Athlete Council, but, you know, all my hard work and our hard work in establishing this committee and fighting for the rights of athletes, you know, pays off and my peers can see that. Did you ever envisage um, when you were playing that you'd become – a leading spokesperson for Paralympic rights. Did you think that no, okay, never. this is this is where I'm going to end up? <laughs> no, no, uh, um, not at all. I I think sometimes I think without I speak without thinking things through. Like earlier on in my career, so I'd be really vocal if I didn't like how something was handled or a situation, and all it was always around you know coach athlete and communication. So. In those situations, I've had to stop and pause and like, how can I make impact here? And so I really changed the way that I led in those communication spaces to give the athlete, like to empower the athletes to say what they're thinking without repercussions or, the, you know, that psychological safety. Um, yeah, but no, I never envisioned that I would be here. Because if you have a look at a shopping list of some of the things that you're doing, okay, so education manager with Paralympics Australia. Uh, you're involved with the International Wheelchair Basketball Federation Athletes Council, WADA, and you also have a role at Sport Integrity Australia as well, don't you? Yeah. Tell us about that role. So it's quite a um, new position for me. So being elected onto the WADA Athlete Council gives us a mere spot here in the Sport Integrity Athlete Advisory Committee. And it's all about learning. So bringing everything that I've learned from WADA and at like the highest level and how we can best impact that here in Australia and spread the message not only for para-athletes but for all athletes in Australia to make sure that we're across everything and, yeah, no one gets left behind. Is anti-doping a major issue amongst Paralympians? I wouldn't say so. I think I personally haven't had a bad experience or know of people who've had, you know, multiple drug tests or tested positive or whatever else. So I I don't think it's a major issue within Paralympics. I mean, I hope not. But in saying that, we need to ensure that athletes consistently, no matter if you're able-bodied or para, are getting tested the same amount. Um, there is a bit of a discrepancy with, you know, para-athletes being tested and I think, you know, I could speculate that it would come down to funding and, and whatnot, but we need to ensure that sport is clean no matter what. Is classification the bigger issue? Yes. Yeah. And manip 
manipulation of classification? Manipulation of classification, I think the integrity there is we're getting on top of it. So we have like lots of educational pieces around misrepresenting yourself and our classification team at Paralympics Australia worked with Sport Integrity to develop classification 101 and what to expect when you're getting classified so we can try and you know mitigate those risks early on and spread awareness and education around this is what's going to happen in classification this is what's going to happen if you misrepresent yourself and yeah try put as much information with the athlete and empower them to make the right decisions and choices so I wouldn't I haven't personally seen many people manipulating classification. I've seen the systems change and other countries and other athletes, you'll look at someone and be like, Oh, what's going on there? You don't really match up to your you know, your points but it's the system. Do you feel as though sometimes uh, the Paralympic movement is is lost in the whole thing because I'm talking here about awareness of sport and uh, education uh, because the focus is very much on the Olympics. Everybody talks about the 2032 Olympics. Yeah. Paralympics just seems to get lost sometime. Um, do you feel as though part of your role is going to be to lift awareness of everything to do with Paralympics? Yeah, absolutely. So as part of my school program that I run with Paralympics Australia, I go out to schools and I educate the kids around the Paralympic movement. I take Paralympians out with us and they share their stories. So we leave the kids with a message to be champions of change and I'll always ask, you know, what's happening in Brisbane in 2032 and a kid will put their hand up and say the Olympics. So glad you said that because there are also the Paralympics that are happening, you know, and I put it back onto the kids. It's their challenge now to say whenever the conversation around the Games is happening, we say Olympics and Paralympics because... We work just as hard, we get paid not nearly as much and it's still high-performance sport. So we're really trying to push that message out to continually using the word Paralympics in those conversations. And when we're referring to it like the Games, hopefully people will then know it's Olympics and Paralympics. Because it can be a driver for social change as well in the wider community, acceptance of people with a disability and uh, you know the way that they overcome that disability and it's not just about sport is it, it it's no. reflective of the of the wider community yeah absolutely and i think if we're educating kids young and we're getting them when they are we can easily i wouldn't want to say manipulate their minds but we can try and push the positive agenda in that people with a disability where it it doesn't – you're putting the barriers on us. It's mm. not the other way around. And when you're, you know, the future CEO or future construction manager or whatever it is that they're going to be the future of, they have to have a whole – like a human-centred design and be super inclusive in whatever they're doing so no one gets left behind because it's not only people with a disability, it's, it's everybody. Discrimination, I guess, um, is a key topic – harassment, racial abuse, etc. Discrimination is right up there though, isn't it, in terms of issues that do affect people with a disability? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, we're trying to educate everybody so that it's not an, it's not going to be an issue. But we only know what we know and it, it has to be on us as humans to try and educate ourselves and get out there and meet as many people and be, you know, gender diverse expose yourself to as many different you know religions races people as possible so we can understand and have that empathy so that we can make the world a better place there are specifics aren't there uh, because obviously you're involved with the international wheelchair basketball federation and i wonder you know sometimes i guess we look at sport through the prism of able-bodied athletes and your role is to inject the issues associated with wheelchair basketball, for instance, or people with um, a disability in terms of wheelchairs, but your role is to inject your perspective into it. Is that how you see it? Yeah. I like to look at my role as super inclusive. So I think 
being nominated for the WADA Athlete Committee, I'm not only representing para-athletes, I'm representing all athletes in Australia mm. um, on our WADA committee. So for me, I've had to really understand what the issues are for everybody and try and see how we can influence that at that board level. So it's it's not an easy task and um, I do have those unconscious biases of para always embedded because yes. that's my experience and whatever I can do to help change or shift mindsets of people for the better to include everybody, I'm, I'm hoping we're getting the message. Because Sport Integrity Australia, I guess, is seen as very much a thorough organisation. Um, sometimes the standards set here and applied elsewhere. Do you put that perspective as well in, into your conversations, saying, listen, we are reasonably well educated as far as um, our programs are concerned, or you know, well educated. Uh, they're quite strict in terms of testing and whatnot. Are you able to put that balance into into conversations that a lot has been done in Australia, even though we're a long way away from everybody else? Yeah, yeah, I am. And it's also really interesting hearing what other countries are doing and then how we can, learn, you know, learn from what they're doing because, um, you know, over in, in Paris, not saying that this is a good example, but in France, their NADO has almost the same amount of power as law enforcement. And that, that to me was shocking. But it's not too dissimilar to here in Australia. Like we work alongside law enforcement and the rules are really clear. And if you don't understand the rules, then that's, I think, a, we've done them a disservice because we haven't provided yeah, to, them to with, with enough, yeah. enough tools. So it's just... For me, it's a big learning piece and what I can take here in Australia and promote that, I'll try my very hardest. <laughs> yes. Were you aware of Sport Integrity Australia uh, prior to to joining the organisation yep. in this role? Did, were you aware of everything that they did? Yeah. yeah, and it wasn't until I was looking at it from like a wider lens that I could see all the work that was happening behind the scenes. Like I could, it was like the puzzle pieces were being put together um, just around like the education piece that we've done here at Sport Integrity Australia around supplements. And then I, I could see the shift. I'm like, oh. Yeah, that makes so much sense. Um, so, yeah, we've had a lot to do with Sport Integrity Australia across the years. We've always had those educational pieces, um, talks, drug tests. Um, so, yeah, it's not, a, it's not a new new thing for us. Yes, and you go out and educate others, don't you, in your role yep. with Paralympics Australia. Ideal uh, position really for a former primary school teacher out yeah. there teaching again, aren't you? Yeah, combining sport... And Paralympics and teaching all together. It's a dream uh, job. And, and an elite athlete yep. to boot. Thanks very much for joining us, Ella, and Thank congratulations you. on the roles you've achieved. Thank you so much. Our next guest is Richard Nicholson, a Paralympic silver medalist across two sports, powerlifting and on the track in the 4x100 relay. Richard's sporting journey began in 1982 at the age of 12 in archery. Less than a year later, he began training and competing in mainstream gymnastics alongside able-bodied competitors. His first disability sport, powerlifting, led to his first Paralympic Games in Atlanta in 1996 at the age of 26. Richard, thanks very much for joining Onside. Oh, pleasure to be here, Tim. You've had an incredible journey and you're able to use that experience now, aren't you, in your current role at Sport Integrity Australia in the partnerships team? Yeah, I've managed to sort of combine both my athletic career or sporting career and a professional career in sports administration across uh, a number of roles in this, from the Australian Sports Commission, AIS, and now in Sport Integrity. What do you remember most about your sporting career, apart from the success on the track, but I guess the, the journey, the battle um, to get recognition in the first place? Um, yeah, well, along the way, I saw the evolution of the Paralympics to, and, and disability sport in Australia go from being essentially a volunteer-based um, run um, sporting events to where the Paralympics are today and, um, you know, one of the major sporting um, events that happens worldwide and, and, you know, attracting global 
um, viewers and and interest and corporate sponsorship. So it's it's been a great journey to be part of that. Going to take you back to those early days, just to look about the experience that you had. Um, can you tell us some of the struggles that you had early on as a Paralympian? Well, I guess when I first entered into um, disability sport in Australia, there were so many small organisations running it. I didn't really know where I fitted in. There was all these um, what we call national sporting organisations for disabilities and there was one for amputees and one for short statured people and one for people with intellectual impairments and one – there was just a plethora of them, you know, one for wheelchair users and – There was athletes competing across all these (laughs) sort of uh, competitions and it was really quite a confusing space and, um, you know, but slowly uh, over time, um, you know, this mainstreaming came in post the Sydney Paralympics and things, you know, our national sporting organisations started taking responsibility for, you know, the inclusion of people with disabilities and that was uh, quite an exciting journey to be part of too. I remember in Atlanta, 1996, and uh, as soon as the Olympics finished, uh, all of the infrastructure suddenly went down, yet the Paralympics were going to start two weeks later. Uh, that must have been disheartening. Yeah, I was. that was my first Paralympic Games, and I was really, like all athletes, excited to get into the village. And when we arrived, there were literally, you know, a swarm of, you know, tradies tearing down various events and various things within inside the um, village and dismantling it and I thought well what's going on here we haven't even started yet and um, you know the Paralympics in 1996 were literally saved by a, a large philanthropic donation by the Shepherd Centre in Atlanta um, or those games would have been cancelled altogether. Was that the spark that you ended up becoming an advocate for people with a, a disability and, and their rights and um, the expectations is that when you thought well gee something's got to be done here? Um to be honest, I think my motivation um, was a little bit more intrinsic in terms of um, I didn't compete well at Atlanta and I knew I could have done better. So I think my main motivation um, following Atlanta was just to become a better athlete. Um, and I felt a lot of those other things were out of my control. Um, and I didn't really start my career in sports administration till just before Sydney Paralympics. So that's when I started to think about a bigger picture and how I could be involved in, in um, changing that for the better. So that was four years later that you, you thought, I'm, I'm going to make a difference here. Yeah, that's right, yeah. Did you receive much support from your fellow athletes when you started voicing concerns about things should be better? I guess I was working at the Australian Sports Commission at the time and um, being an athlete, yeah, I heard a lot of athlete voices and I could sort of, I had a voice within that organisation to think about and talk about things that weren't quite right and the inequity that was, you know, glaringly apparent at that time between, I guess, able-bodied sport and and sport for people with disabilities. Do you think we've reached a a point that is a level playing field yet, though? Um, It's certainly changed a lot for the better. Um, I think there's certainly always more work can be done in this space, you know. yeah, we get, we're much closer. Because you didn't have a lot of funding, did you, in the lead-up, for instance, to 1996 and and even for the next four years. It was a home games in, in Sydney, so you had a bit more funding. Uh, yeah, there to, was a little to, bit more funding yeah. come in um, to disability sport because it was a home games and obviously Australia wants to do well at their home games and we topped the medal tally. So that was, you know, it was an outstanding performance by all our athletes, the administrators and coaches and everyone involved, you know, um, putting that event on and being part of that team. It was outstanding. Um, but it was really post-2000 um, and the, the goodwill that the Paralympics brought throughout the Australian community that is, I thought that really spurred on um, you know, the acceptance and, and people wanting to be involved in disability sport. I thought post the Games was the real watershed moment for disability sport in Australia. Because it's broader than sport, isn't it? Uh, what sport can bring to the table in terms of showcasing Paralympians and people with a disability in the incredible things that they can do, that translates to the general community, not just sport, doesn't it? Yeah, well, um, there, there was one incident at the Sydney Paralympic Games that you know really did change my feeling about sport and my role within it, and that was one day I was walking between 
a couple of the venues at um, Sydney Olympic Park and there was a um, a young boy with his mother and he said, oh, mum, I wonder what that that man does, you know. What sport, he, that, yeah, what sport that what, man what, what, what sport does that man play, you know. And um, it really made me stop and think because, you know, for the previous 20 years I'd heard children sort of say, oh, why does that man use crutches or why is that man, you know, in a wheelchair or, or what's wrong with that man, you know. And there's simple fair enough questions from a young you know, curious mind. Um, but this time he was talking about, I wonder what sport that man plays. And I realised that the power of sport to, has to change the um, perceptions of disability within the community. And, you know, I was very fast learning what sport was doing for me in my life and changing, I guess, perceptions I had of myself. You know, So it was a really powerful moment. The language has changed as well, which brings me to my next point about talking about perceptions, but also the way that we describe Paralympians. You know, it's no longer people with disabilities competing in sport. It, it's Paralympians to mm-hmm. see what incredible feats they can achieve. Yeah, the language has changed and, and, and that's actually quite important, I think. You know, the society's beliefs and cultures and values are based around the language that we do use. So um, change in language can go a long way and, you know, leading into the um, London Paralympic Games, for instance, Sebastian Coe, you know, he was the head honcho, he was running the show and he always, any time he mentioned the Olympic Games, he always mentioned the Paralympic Games in the same sentence and he promoted there's a, a six-week sporting festival, you know, um, yep. as one event with, with two games and uh, the language that he used and the way that the London Paralympics in particular was promoted was fantastic. So how do you see... Uh, Paralympic sport and the role of Paralympians continuing to influence you being a a former athlete, now in your role at Sport Integrity Australia with the partnerships team, what influence do you see that um, can be made through your eyes and your role here? Well, just if you just look at sort of recently, you know, the current batch of Paralympians, they the articles are no um they've got articles not only just sort of on the back pages of sport which was a feat in itself at some stage you know i remember louise savage winning a boston marathon and barely getting two lines in that you know in, in a news in brief um and nowadays you've you know if you've got athletes like madison de rosario and she's appearing in all sorts of different magazines across different media f- um spaces and there's just a lot more um, promotion and a lot more acceptance. People want to know about the the stories behind the athletes and things like that. So, yeah, it's changed significantly. Yes, the backstories have become increasingly important, haven't they? Yeah, definitely. And certainly, every para everyone has a backstory, but a lot of the Paralympic ones are are quite intriguing. You know, they're all a little bit different, of course. You know, and you've got someone like Curtis McGrath, who he um you know lost both his legs in a in a um, explosion in Afghanistan, and and you know is now one of the world's top paddlers, and he's got a fantastic backstory. And there's all every Paralympian has a fantastic backstory. Do you see yourself playing an important role going forward in the, in Paralympic sport, even though you're not not a competitor anymore? But do you sort of see yourself as being an important voice out there? Um, probably not in the mainstream, but certainly you know I'm conscious of my lived experience within. Um, Sport Integrity Australia and I would like to think that I would be able to bring something to the table within the organisation, across the organisation that um, may have some you know, impact across Paralympic sport if just not making sure that everyone in, in our organisation is aware of disability sport and, and how it operates and how we can support it. Yes, because that, that lived experience that you've had becomes incredibly relatable, doesn't it, to athletes, administrators, when they know that you've been there, done that? Yeah, well, I guess lived experience. I mean, if if you haven't had that lived experience, it just becomes a, a case study. But if you've had that lived experience, I think it, it adds a lot more weight to, you know, anything that you might be saying or, or wanting to achieve or influence. In general life, uh, you know, it, is it easy to get around for yourself in a wheelchair? Are, are there things that still need to be done infrastructure-wise and acceptance-wise? Do you still feel as though there are important steps to be made there? Oh, Australia as a whole is a pretty good, you know, mm. well-developed country and we're pretty good in that space. But there's, yeah, there's the odd occasion where you get where there's, um, you know, there's, there's just steps. That's the only access into a building and things like that. I think overall the access, physical access in Australia is, is pretty good. 
um, you know, the, unfortunately, the biggest barrier to, I guess, inclusion of people with disabilities is always that attitudinal battle, mm. barrier. And, you know, in the last, certainly in the last 20 years, I think a lot of those barriers have been sort of broken down, but there's still sometimes um, problems, you know, sometimes flying domestically in Australia on our airlines can be quite challenging for uh, people in wheelchairs and people with disabilities. So that still occurs. But life, uh, life's okay. Yeah, life's okay. <laughs> okay. Good on you, Richard. Thanks very much for joining us and on side and, and all the best and well done on your role here at Sport Integrity Australia. Okay, thanks very much, Tim. Thanks for listening to Onside. I'm Tim Gable. We'll have another episode shortly. You've been listening to Onside, the official podcast of Sport Integrity Australia. Send in your podcast questions or suggestions to media at sportintegrity.gov.au. For more information on Sport Integrity Australia, please visit our website, www.sportintegrity.gov.au, or check out our Clean Sport app.